Derry. The first interlude. Can an entire city be haunted? Haunted as some houses are supposed to be haunted? Not just a single building in that city, or the corner of a single street, or a single basketball court in a single pocket park, the netless basket jutting out at sunset like some obscure and bloody instrument of torture, not just one area but everything. The whole works. Can that be? Listen, haunted, often visited by ghosts or spirits. Funk and Vanyals. Haunting, persistently recurring to the mind, difficult to forget. Ditto Funk and Friend. To haunt, to appear or recur often, especially as a ghost. But and listen, a place often visited, resort, den, hangout. Italics are or course mine. And one more. This one, like the last, is a definition of haunt as a noun, and it's the one that really scares me, a feeding place for animals. Like the animals that beat up Adrian Mellon and then threw him over the bridge. Like the animal that was waiting underneath the bridge. A feeding place for animals. What's feeding in dairy? What's feeding on dairy? You know, it's sort of interesting I didn't know it was possible for a man to become as frightened as I have become since the Adrian Mellon business and still live, let alone function. It's as if I've fallen into a story, and everyone knows you're not supposed to feel this afraid until the end of the story, when the haunter of the dark finally comes out of the woodwork to feed. On you, of course. On you. But if this is a story, it's not one of those classic screamers by Lovecraft or Bradbury or Poe. I know, you see not everything, but a lot. I didn't just start when I opened the Dairy News one day last September, read the transcript of the Unwin Boys preliminary hearing, and realized that the clown who killed George Denbra might well be back again. I actually started around 1980 I think that is when some part of me which had been asleep woke up. Knowing that it's time might be coming round again. What part? The watchman part, I suppose. Or maybe it was the voice of the turtle. Yes. I rather think it was that. I know it's what Bill Denbra would believe. I discovered news of old horrors in old books, read intelligence of old atrocities in old periodicals, always in the back of my mind, every day a bit louder, I heard the seashell drone of some growing, coalescing force, I seemed to smell the bitter ozone aroma of lightnings to come. I began making notes for a book I will almost certainly not live to write. And at the same time I went on with my life. On one level of my mind I was and am living with the most grotesque, capering horrors, on another I have continued to live the mundane life of a small city librarian. I shelve books, I make out library cards for new patrons, I turn off the microfilm readers careless users sometimes leave on, I joke with Carol Danner about how much I would like to go to bed with her, and she jokes back about how much she'd like to go to bed with me, and both of us know that she's really joking and I'm really not, just as both of us know that she won't stay in a little place like Derry for long and I will be here until I die, taping torn pages in Business Week, sitting down at monthly acquisition meetings with my pipe in one hand and a stack of library journals in the other. And waking in the middle of the night with my fists jammed against my mouth to keep in the screams. The gothic conventions are all wrong. My hair has not turned white. I do not sleepwalk. I have not begun to make cryptic comments or to carry a planchette around in my sport coat pocket. I think I laugh a little more, that's all and sometimes it must seem a little shrill and strange, because sometimes people look at me oddly when I laugh. Part of me the part Bill would call the voice of the turtle says I should call them all, tonight. But am I, even now, completely sure? Do I want to be completely sure? No of course not. But God, what happened to Adrian Mellon is so much like what happened to stuttering Bill's brother, George, in the fall of 1957. If it has started again, I will call them. I'll have to. But not yet. It's too early anyway. Last time it began slowly and didn't really get going until the summer of 1958. So. I wait. 
and fill up the waiting with words in this notebook and long moments of looking into the mirror to see the stranger the boy became. The boy's face was bookish and timid, the man's face is the face of a bank teller in a western movie, the fellow who never has any lines, the one who just gets to put his hands up and look scared when the robbers come in. And if the script calls for anyone to get shot by the bad guys, he's the one. Same old Mike. A little starry in the eyes, maybe, and a little punchy from broken sleep, but not so's you'd notice without a good close look. Like kissing distance close, and I haven't been that close to anyone in a very long time. If you took a casual glance at me you might think he's been reading too many books, but that's all. I doubt you'd guess how hard the man with the mild bank teller's face is now struggling just to hold on, to hold on to his own mind. If I have to make those calls, it may kill some of them. That's one of the things I've had to face on the long nights when sleep won't come, nights when I lie there in bed wearing my conservative blue pajamas, my spectacles neatly folded up and lying on the nightable next to the glass of water I always put there in case I wake up thirsty in the night. I lie there in the dark and I take small sips of the water and I wonder how much or how little they remember. I am somehow convinced that they don't remember any of it, because they don't need to remember. I'm the only one that hears the voice of the turtle, the only one who remembers, because I'm the only one who stayed here in Derry. And because they're scattered to the four winds, they have no way of knowing the identical patterns their lives have taken. To bring them back, to show them that pattern. Yes, it might kill some of them. It might kill all of them. So I go over it and over it in my mind, I go over them, trying to recreate them as they were and as they might now be, trying to decide which of them is the most vulnerable. Richie Trashmouth Tozier, I think sometimes he was the one Chris, Huggins and Bowers seemed to catch up with the most often, in spite of the fact that Ben was so fat. Bowers was the one Richie was the most scared of the one we were all the most scared of but the others used to really put the fear of God into him, too. If I call him out there in California would he see it as some horrible return of the big bullies, two from the grave and one from the madhouse in Juniper Hill where he raves to this day? Sometimes I think Eddie was the weakest, Eddie with his domineering tank of a mother and his terrible case of asthma. Beverly. She always tried to talk so tough, but she was as scared as the rest of us. Stuttering Bill, faced with a horror that won't go away when he puts the cover on his typewriter? Stan Uris. There's a guillotine blade hanging over their lives, razor sharp, but the more I think about it the more I think they don't know that blade is there. I'm the one with my hand on the lever. I can pull it just by opening my telephone notebook and calling them, one after the other. Maybe I won't have to do it. I hold on to the waning hope that I've mistaken the rabbity cries of my own timid mind for the deeper, truer voice of the turtle. After all, what do I have? Melon in July. A child found dead on Neobold Street last October, another found in Memorial Park in early December, just before the first snowfall. Maybe it was a tramp, as the papers say. Or a crazy who since left Derry or killed himself out of remorse and self-disgust, as some of the books say the real Jack the Ripper may have done. Maybe. But the Albrecht girl was found directly across the street from that damned old house on Neobold Street. And she was killed on the same day as George Denbra was, 27 years before. And then the Johnson boy, found in Memorial Park with one of his legs missing below the knee. Memorial Park is, of course, the home of the dairy standpipe, and the boy was found almost at its foot. The standpipe is within a shout of the barons, the standpipe is also where Stan Ura saw those boys. Those dead boys. Still, it could all be nothing but smoke and mirages. Could be. Or coincidence. Or perhaps something between the two a kind of malefic echo. Could that be? I sense that it could be. Here in Derry, anything could be. I think what was here before is still here the thing that was here in 1957 and 1958, the thing that was here in 1929 and in 1930 when the black spot was burned down by the main legion of white decency, 
The thing that was here in 1904 and 1905 and early 1906 at least until the Kitchener Ironworks exploded, the thing that was here in 1876 and 1877, the thing that has shown up every 27 years or so. Sometimes it comes a little sooner, sometimes a little later. But it always comes. As one goes back the wrong notes are harder and harder to find because the records grow poorer and the moth holes in the narrative history of the area grow bigger. But knowing where to look and when to look goes a long way toward solving the problem. It always comes back, you see. It? So yes, I think I'll have to make those calls. I think it was meant to be us. Somehow, for some reason, we're the ones who have been elected to stop it forever. Blind fate? Blind luck? Or is it that damn turtle again? Does it perhaps command as well as speak? I don't know. And I doubt if it matters. All those years ago Bill said the turtle can't help us, and if it was true then it must be true now. I think of us standing in the water, hands clasped, making that promise to come back if it ever started again standing there almost like druids in a ring, our hands bleeding their own promise, palm to palm. A ritual that is perhaps as old as mankind itself, an unknowing tap driven into the tree of all power the one that grows on the borderline between the land of all we know and that of all we suspect. Because the similarities but I'm doing my own Bill Denbrawl here, stuttering over the same ground again and again, reciting a few facts and a lot of unpleasant, and rather gaseous, suppositions, growing more and more obsessive with every paragraph. No good. Useless. Dangerous, even. But it is so very hard to wait on events. This notebook is supposed to be an effort to get beyond that obsession by widening the focus of my attention after all, there is more to this story than six boys and one girl, none of them happy, none of them accepted by their peers, who stumbled into a nightmare during one hot summer when Eisenhower was still president. It is an attempt to pull the camera back a little, if you will to see the whole city, a place where nearly 35,000 people work and eat and sleep and copulate and shop and drive around and walk and go to school and go to jail and sometimes disappear into the dark. To know what a place is, I really do believe one has to know what it was. And if I had to name a day when all of this really started again for me, it would be the day in the early spring of 1980 when I went to see Albert Carson, who died last summer at 91, he was full of years as well as honors. He was head librarian here from 1914 to 1960, an incredible span, but he was an incredible man, and I felt that if anyone would know which history of this area was the best one to start with, Albert Carson would. I asked him my question as we sat on his porch and he gave me my answer, speaking in a croak he was already fighting the throat cancer which would eventually kill him. Not one of them is worth a shit. As you damn well know. Then where should I start? Start what, for Christ's sake? Researching the history of the area. Of Derry Township. Oh. Well. Start with the Fricka and the Michaud. They're supposed to be the best. And after I read those read them? Christ, no. Throw em in the waste basket. That's your first step. Then read Buddinger. Branson Buddinger was a damned sloppy researcher and afflicted with a terminal boner, if half of what I heard when I was a kid was true, but when it came to Derry his heart was in the right place. He got most of the facts wrong, but he got them wrong with feeling, Hanlon. I laughed a little and Carson grinned with his leathery lips an expression of good humor that was actually a little frightening. In that instant he looked like a vulture happily guarding a freshly killed animal, waiting for it to reach exactly the right stage of tasty decomposition before beginning to dine. When you finish with budding er, read Ives. Make notes on all the people he talked to. Sandy Ives is still at the University of Maine. Folklorist. After you read him, go see him. Buy him a dinner. I'd take him to the Orinoca, because dinner at the Orinoca seems to never end. Pump him. Fill up a notebook with names and addresses. Talk to the old timers he's talked to those that are still left, there are a few of us, ah ha ha ha, 
and get some more names from them. By then you'll have all the place to stand you'll need, if you're half as bright as I think you are. If you chase down enough people, you'll find out a few things that aren't in the histories. And you may find they disturb your sleep. Dairy. What about it? Dairy's not right, is it? Right, he asked in that whispery croak. What's right? What does that word mean? Is right pretty pictures of the Kendaski get sunset, Kodachrome by so and so, F stop such and such? If so, then Derry is right, because there are pretty pictures of it by the score. Is right a damned committee of dry boxed old virgins to save the governor's mansion or to put a commemorative plaque in front of the standpipe? If that's right, then Derry's right as rain because we've got more than our share of old kitty cats minding everybody's business. Is right that ugly plastic statue of Paul Bunyan in front of city center? Oh, if I had a truck full of napalm and my old Zippo lighter I'd take care of that fucking thing, I assure you. But if one's aesthetic is broad enough to include plastic statues, then Derry is right. The question is, what does right mean to you, Hanlon? Eh. More to the point, what does right not mean? I could only shake my head. He either knew or he didn't. He would either tell or he wouldn't. Do you mean the unpleasant stories you may hear, or the ones you already know? There are always unpleasant stories. A town's history is like a rambling old mansion filled with rooms and cubby holes and laundry chutes and garrets and all sorts of eccentric little hiding places. Not to mention an occasional secret passage or two. If you go exploring Mansion Dairy, you'll find all sorts of things. Yes. You may be sorry later, but you'll find them, and once a thing is found it can't be unfound, can it? Some of the rooms are locked, but there are keys. There are keys. His eyes glinted at me with an old man's shrewdness. You may come to think you've stumbled on the worst of Dairy's secrets. But there is always one more. And one more. And one more. Do you I think I shall have to ask you to excuse me just now. My throat is very bad today. It's time for my medicine and my nap. In other words, here is a knife and a fork, my friend, go see what you can cut with them. I started with the Fricka history and the Michaud history. I followed Carson's advice and threw them in the waste basket, but I read them first. They were as bad as he had suggested. I read the Buttinger history, copied out the footnotes, and chased them down. That was more satisfactory, but footnotes are peculiar things, you know like footpaths twisting through a wild and anarchic country. They split, then they split again, at any point you may take a wrong turn which leads you either to a bramble choked dead end or into swampy quick mud. If you find a footnote, a library science prof once told a class of which I was a part, step on its head and kill it before it can breed. They do breed, and sometimes the breeding is a good thing, but I think that more often it is not. Those in budding are stiffly written a history of old dairy, Orono, University of Maine Press, 1950, wander through 100 years worth of forgotten books and dusty master's dissertations in the fields of history and folklore, through articles in defunct magazines, and amid brain-numbing stacks of town reports and ledgers. My conversations with Sandy Ives were more interesting. His sources crossed Buddingers from time to time, but a crossing was all it ever was. Ives had spent a good part of his lifetime setting down oral histories yarns, in other words almost verbatim, a practice Branson Buddinger would undoubtedly have seen as taking the low road. Ives had written a cycle of articles on dairy during the years 1963-66. Most of the old-timers he talked to then were dead by the time I started my own investigations, but they had sons, daughters, nephews, cousins. And, of course, one of the great true facts of the world is this, for every old-timer who dies, there's a new old-timer coming along. And a good story never dies, it is always passed down. I sat on a lot of porches and back stoops, drank a lot of tea, black label beer, homemade beer, homemade root beer, tap water, spring water. I did a lot of listening, 
and the wheels of my tape player turned. Both Buddinger and Ives agreed completely on one point, the original party of white settlers numbered about 300. They were English. They had a charter and were formally known as the Dairy Company. The land granted them covered what is today Dairy, most of Newport, and little slices of the surrounding towns. And in the year 1741 everyone in Derry Township just disappeared. They were there in June of that year a community which at that time numbered about 340 souls but come October they were gone. The little village of Wooden Homes stood utterly deserted. One of them, which once stood roughly at the place where Witcham and Jackson Streets intersect today, was burned to the ground. The Michaud history states firmly that all of the villagers were slaughtered by Indians, but there is no basis save the one burned house for that idea. More likely, someone's stove just got too hot and the house went up in flames. Indian massacre? Doubtful. No bones, no bodies. Flood? Not that year. Disease? No word of it in the surrounding towns. They just disappeared. All of them. All 340 of them. Without a trace. So far as I know, the only case remotely like it in American history is the disappearance of the colonists on Roanoke Island, Virginia. Every school child in the country knows about that one, but who knows about the dairy disappearance? Not even the people who live here, apparently. I quizzed several junior high students who are taking the required main history course, and none of them knew a thing about it. Then I checked the text, main then and now. There are better than 40 index entries for dairy, most of them concerning the boom years of the lumber industry. Nothing about the disappearance of the original colonists. And yet that what shall I call it, that quiet fits the pattern, too. There is a kind of curtain of quiet which cloaks much of what has happened here. And yet people do talk. I guess nothing can stop people from talking. But you have to listen hard, and that is a rare skill. I flatter myself that I've developed it over the last four years. If I haven't, then my aptitude for the job must be poor indeed, because I've had enough practice. An old man told me about how his wife had heard voices speaking to her from the drain of her kitchen sink in the three weeks before their daughter died that was in the early winter of 1957-58. The girl he spoke of was one of the early victims in the murder spree which began with George Denbra and did not end until the following summer. A whole slew of voices, all of M. Babylon together, he told me. He owned a Gulf station on Kansas Street and talked in between slow, limping trips out to the pumps, where he filled gas tanks, checked oil levels, and wiped windshields. Said she spoke back once, even though she was a scared. Leaned right over the drain, she did, and hollered down into it. Who the hell are you, she calls. What's your name? And all these voices answered back, she said grunts and babbles and howls and yips, screams and Logan, don't you know? And she said they were saying what the possessed man said to Jesus, our name is Legion, they said. She wouldn't go near that sink for two years. For them two years I'd spend twelve hours a day down here, bust in my hump, then have to go home and wash all the damn dishes. He was drinking a can of Pepsi from the machine outside the office door, a man of 72 or dash 3 in faded gray work fatigues, rivers of wrinkles flowing down from the corners of his eyes and mouth. By now you probably think I'm as crazy as a bedbug, he said, but I'll tell you something else, if you'll turn off why whirly jig, there. I turned off my tape recorder and smiled at him. Considering some of the things I've heard over the last couple of years, You'd have to go a fair country distance to convince me you're crazy, I said. He smiled back, but there was no humor in it. I was doing the dishes one night, same as usual this was in the fall of 58, after things had settled down again. My wife was upstairs, sleeping. Betty was the only kid God ever saw fit to give us, and after she was killed my wife spent a lot of her time sleeping. Anyway, I pulled the plug and the water started running out of the sink. You know the sound real soapy water makes when it goes down the drain? Kind of a suckin' sound, it is. 
It was making that noise, but I wasn't thinking about it, only about going out and chopping some kindling in the shed, and just as that sound started to die off, I heard my daughter down in there. I heard Betty somewhere down in those friggin' pipes. Logan. She was somewheres down there in the dark, Logan. Only it sounded more like she was screaming, once you listened a bit. Or both. Screaming and Logan down there in the pipes. That's the only time I ever heard anything like that. Maybe I just imagined it. But. I don't think so. He looked at me and I looked at him. The light falling through the dirty plate glass windows onto his face filled him up with years, made him look as ancient as Methuselah. I remember how cold I felt at that moment, how cold. You think I'm storying you along, the old man asked me, the old man who would have been just about 45 in 1957, the old man to whom God had given a single daughter, Betty Ripsom by name. Betty had been found on Outer Jackson Street just after Christmas of that year, frozen, her remains ripped wide open. No, I said. I don't think you're just storying me along, Mr. Ripsom. And you're telling the truth, too, he said with a kind of wonder. I can see it on Y face. I think he meant to tell me something more then, but the bell behind us dinged sharply as a car rolled over the hose on the tarmac and pulled up to the pumps. When the bell rang, both of us jumped and I uttered a thin little cry. Ripsom got to his feet and limped out to the car, wiping his hands on a ball of waste. When he came back in, he looked at me as though I were a rather unsavory stranger who had just happened to wander in off the street. I made my goodbyes and left. Buttinger and Ives agree on something else, things really are not right here in Derry, things in Derry have never been right. I saw Albert Carson for the last time a scant month before he died. His throat had gotten much worse, all he could manage was a hissing little whisper. Still thinking about writing a history of Derry, Hanlon. Still toying with the idea, I said, but I had of course never planned to write a history of the township not exactly and I think he knew it. It would take you twenty years, he whispered, and no one would read it? No one would want to read it? Let it go, Hanlon. He paused a moment and then added, budding or committed suicide, you know. Of course I had known that but only because people always talk and I had learned to listen. The article in the news had called it a falling accident, and it was true that Branson Buttinger had taken a fall. What the news neglected to mention was that he fell from a stool in his closet and he had a noose around his neck at the time. You know about the cycle. I looked at him, startled. Oh yes, Carson whispered. I know. Every 26 or 27 years. Buttinger knew, too. A lot of the old-timers do, although that is one thing they won't talk about, even if you load them up with booze. Let it go, Hanlon. He reached out with one bird claw hand. He closed it around my wrist and I could feel the hot cancer that was loose and raving through his body, eating anything and everything left that was still good to eat not that there could have been much by that time, Albert Carson's cupboards were almost bare. Michael this is nothing you want to mess into. There are things here in Derry that bite. Let it go. Let it go. I can't. Then beware, he said. Suddenly the huge and frightened eyes of a child were looking out of his dying old man's face. Beware. Derry. My hometown. Named after the county of the same name in Ireland. Derry. I was born here, in Derry Home Hospital, attended Derry Elementary School, went to junior high at 9th Street Middle School, to high school at Derry High. I went to the University of Maine ain't in Derry, but it's just down the road, the old timers say and then I came right back here. To the Derry Public Library. I am a small town man living a small town life, one among millions. But. But. In 1879 a crew of lumberjacks found the remains of another crew that had spent the winter snowed in at a camp on the upper Kenduskeag at the tip of what the kids still call the Barrens. There were nine of them in all, all nine hacked to pieces. Heads had rolled. Not to mention arms. A foot or two. 
and a man's penis had been nailed to one wall of the cabin. But, in 1851 John Markson killed his entire family with poison and then, sitting in the middle of the circle he had made with their corpses, he gobbled an entire white nightshade mushroom. His death agonies must have been intense. The town constable who found him wrote in his report that at first he believed the corpse was grinning at him, he wrote of Markson's awful white smile. The white smile was an entire mouthful of the killer mushroom, Markson had gone on eating even as the cramps and the excruciating muscle spasms must have been racking his dying body. But, on Easter Sunday 1906 the owners of the Kitchener Iron Works, which stood where the brand spanking new Dairy Mall now stands, held an Easter egg hunt for all the good children of Dairy. The hunt took place in the huge Iron Works building. Dangerous areas were closed off, and employees volunteered their time to stand guard and make sure no adventurous boy or girl decided to duck under the barriers and explore. 500 chocolate Easter eggs wrapped in gay ribbons were hidden about the rest of the works. According to Buddinger, there was at least one child present for each of those eggs. They ran giggling and hooping and yelling through the Sunday silent iron works, finding the eggs under the giant tipper vats, inside the desk drawers of the foreman, balanced between the great rusty teeth of gear wheels, inside the molds on the third floor, in the old photographs these molds look like cupcake tins from some giant's kitchen. Three generations of kitcheners were there to watch the gay riot and to award prizes at the end of the hunt, which was to come at four o'clock, whether all the eggs had been found or not. The end actually came 45 minutes early, at quarter past three. That was when the ironworks exploded. 72 people were pulled dead from the wreckage before the sun went down. The final toll was 102. 88 of the dead were children. On the following Wednesday, while the city still lay in stunned silent contemplation of the tragedy, a woman found the head of nine-year-old Robert Dohahi caught in the limbs of her backyard apple tree. There was chocolate on the Dohahi lad's teeth and blood in his hair. He was the last of the known dead. Eight children and one adult were never accounted for. It was the worst tragedy in Derry's history, even worse than the fire at the Black Spot in 1930, and it was never explained. All four of the ironworks boilers were shut down. Not just banked, shut down. But, the murder rate in Derry is six times the murder rate of any other town of comparable size in New England. I found my tentative conclusions in this matter so difficult to believe that I turned my figures over to one of the high school hackers, who spends what time he doesn't spend in front of his Commodore here in the library. He went several steps further scratch a hacker, find an overachiever by adding another dozen small cities to what he called the stat pool and presenting me with a computer-generated bar graph where dairy sticks out like a sore thumb. People must have wicked short tempers here, Mr. Hanlon was his only comment. I didn't reply. If I had, I might have told him that something in Derry has a wicked short temper, anyway. Here in Derry children disappear unexplained and unfound at the rate of 40 to 60 a year. Most are teenagers. They are assumed to be runaways. I suppose some of them even are. And during what Albert Carson would undoubtedly have called the time of the cycle, the rate of disappearance shoots nearly out of sight. In the year 1930, for instance the year the black spot burned there were better than 170 child disappearances in Derry and you must remember that these are only the disappearances which were reported to the police and thus documented. Nothing surprising about it, the current chief of police told me when I showed him the statistic. It was the depression. Most of them probably got tired of eating potato soup or going flat hungry at home and went of riding the rods, looking for something better. During 1958, 127 children, ranging in age from 3 to 19, were reported missing in Derry. Was there a depression in 1958? I asked Chief Radamacher. No, he said. But people move around a lot, Hanlon. Kids in particular get itchy feet. Have a fight with the folks about coming in late after a date and boom, they're gone. I showed Chief Radamacher the picture of Chad Lowe which had appeared in the Dairy News in April 1958. 
You think this one ran away after a fight with his folks about coming in late, Chief Radamacher? He was three and a half when he dropped out of sight. Radamacher fixed me with a sour glance and told me it sure had been nice talking with me, but if there was nothing else, he was busy. I left. Haunted, haunting, haunt. Often visited by ghosts or spirits, as in the pipes under the sink, to appear or recur often, as every 25, 26 or 27 years, a feeding place for animals, as in the cases of George Denbra, Adrian Mellon, Betty Ripsom, the Albrecht girl, the Johnson boy. A feeding place for animals. Yes, that's the one that haunts me. If anything else happens anything at all I'll make the calls. I'll have to. In the meantime I have my suppositions, my broken rest, and my memories my damned memories. Oh, and one other thing I have this notebook, don't I? The wall I wail to. And here I sit, my hand shaking so badly I can hardly write in it, here I sit in the deserted library after closing, listening to faint sounds in the dark stacks, watching the shadows thrown by the dim yellow globes to make sure they don't move. Don't change. Here I sit next to the telephone. I put my free hand on it. Let it slide down. Touch the holes in the dial that could put me in touch with all of them, my old pals. We went deep together. We went into the black together. Would we come out of the black if we went in a second time? I don't think so. Please God I don't have to call them. Please God.